thank you very much for, for joining us. I know um, you've been a long advocate of uh, an effort-based uh, regime rather than a quota-based regime or indeed potentially a hybrid type of model. And you'll be aware that the White Paper um, set out a commitment to pilot that, particularly with the uh, inshore mixed fishery. I wondered if you could just um, set out what your thoughts are uh, in, in this respect and why you think an effort-based regime would be better than a quota-based regime. Well, to start with, overall, we were very happy with the White Paper. Uh, the bill somewhat um, disappointed is that a lot of what was good and gave a lot of hope to people had disappeared and an effort pilot was one such thing. Uh, we have been staunch advocates of that because over 30 years um, with increasing regulatory burden we've tried to go up a cul-de-sac where it hasn't worked. So we've had blackfish, discards, now we're on to choke species. So we sat back and went, what is, as the, the Minister likes to coin a phrase himself, first principles of management? And that was the ecosystem. You've got to work with Mother Nature. Currently, just now, all the problems, many of what the members have discussed uh, today, uh, whether it's enforcement, whether it's science, um, whether it's shares of resources, all come and stem from the current quota system. So what we said is the only way to manage a, a dynamic mixed fishery, where you catch a mix of species that fluctuate up and down, and it's difficult to determine exact quantitative arbitrary figures such as quotas, is to say to the vessels, what is the sustainable level of time that vessels need to catch a sustainable amount of fish from an ecosystem? So if the North Sea combined, you can take 200,000 tonnes of biomass from that ecosystem, how long does it take your fleet collectively to do that? So what we said was, OK, that then allows vessels to land all catches. That means you see exactly what the fluctuations and the dynamism in the marine environment is. That generates accurate science and therefore you're flowing along with the environment rather than what we're trying to do just now which is impose arbitrary theoretical targets and then trying to hit them. It's been proved not to work. Just to finish before um, Mr Aldous asks a question, what we did conclude very quickly and this is what we brought to the department as a solution that I think answers most questions is that effort control alone does not work. Blunt time at sea, especially in a blunt measurement like days at sea, doesn't work. And what we've developed is a system where you adopt FQAs, so there's no contention of people being, um, having, losing their investment in that. And what you do is you adopt FQAs and you turn them into a percentage people should aim to catch. So it isn't an arbitrary weight you're aiming for. What you're aiming for is a percentage-based mix of what is deemed to be sustainable. And if you catch without that without side that percentage, what happens is you lose time and compensation. So, therefore, as the vessel is losing time for catching the wrong fish that is able to land for that time penalty, his effort burden on the environment is coming back. And therefore, since the fish that's been landed has almost been time for the crime, then scientists know that's a true representation of what's going on. We've not asked over two years for this to be dropped out of the sky, as some of the amendments in the bill seem to be. For an enabling bill, there are some clauses there that seem to be a shopping list for DEFRA. What we're asking for is a trial of it, because we do truly believe that for a unique system anywhere in the world, we've got a system here that could get us away from poor science, solve the problem of FQAs and who owns them, and get us towards a far more sustainable fisheries management system. So we would implore members to put in a legislative requirement that a trial across the fleet, not just inshore, is enacted to give us an alternative solution. If it fails, it fails. And if it's proved right, well, we've lost nothing but gained a lot. Thank you. I pray, just to, to clarify, obviously there's a, there's a different purpose behind a white paper which sets out your mm. policy and what you uh, seek to do with the powers and a bill which establishes the legal powers you need to deliver your policy. Yeah. And so um, we wouldn't need a specific clause to say you must run a trial in order to be able to run a trial. The legal powers to run a trial are, are contained in, in the existing clauses of mm. the bill. But I just coming back to the principle... The difficulty with fisheries is that uh, you said effort doesn't work, but the problem is nothing quite works on fisheries, and this is why it becomes a circular argument. So um, you seem to be arguing for a return to catch composition rules, which themselves became slightly discredited to people trying to move away from them. And isn't the, the challenge, the challenge is that an effort regime works best in a mixed fishery where it's harder to uh, segregate out the fish. Absolutely but, a, but a tonnage system works best in, say, the yeah. pelagic. Absolutely. We would say for pelagic species where you're catching an individual bulk species and vessels can, can reasonably accurately target that, although at times you do get it wrong, that quota system is fine. The problem is that dynamic mixed fisheries, the white fish, and, and we include nephrops into that mixed fishery. 
What we are saying is catch compositions, but not arbitrary limits again, which is a problem. It's got flexibility. So what you're effectively doing under this system to avoid a race to fish, avoid just giving people time, a blunt dollop of time, and off they go and target the, the highest value species because it's economically incentive is there to do that. What you're effectively doing is allow a buffer scheme, if you like. It's a trading scheme. OK, I've caught the wrong fish. It's worth money. Rather than discard it back into the sea unrecorded and keep fishing and killing more of that species whilst trying to find one you can keep, what you're moving towards is trading overall ceiling of effort for that wrong fish. So it's a compensation scheme, effectively, where you're getting the financial benefit of that fish. Your men are getting a pay, uh, which is a thing we'll come on to with the, the, the system that DEFRA proposes for discards. But overall, your ceiling in the year is coming down to meet you. It would solve the bass problem. You could put in a zero catch composition for bass. Any catches have got a time penalty. Boats could be tied up in the Monday, but they would have that bass landed in the financial benefit of it. It would work for spur dogs. So we really do believe there's a system here that really does merit properly having a, a good look at it and a proper scrutiny and trial of it. Because as we say, we lose nothing uh, if it fails and we gain everything if it succeeds. OK. Luke Pollard. Thank you. Do you think fish should be a public asset and define that on the face of the bill? I think absolutely yes. I think they've always been that case. I was very pleased to hear uh, Dr Tom Appleby state that. Many of the other NGOs have said that. The idea of privatising what has always been even with the FQA system, it says in the paperwork that people get through, it should not be bartered, sold or bought. It just happens to be the industry has gone and done it. So really, fish always has been a public resource. Uh, various judicial um, hearings have defined that as well. And indeed, it probably stretches all the way back into Magna Carta, right back through our constitution. At the end of the day, members of this House, we as fishermen, uh, as the members of the public who catch it, are only custodians of what is the nation's to look after it, to husband it well for current generations and future ones. So, no, very much we would like to see a, a clause put in uh, towards that. One of the questions asked earlier was about auctioning additional fishing opportunities. Mm -hmm. And one of the key concerns that Fishing for Leave have in particular raised when we've met has been about how auctioning could favour those people that already have quota, that yep. already have cash, yep. and that wouldn't support the small boats with whom actually that probably should be the greater focus on. Do you, have you got any particular concerns about where auctioning sits? Well, that was one of the main five things that is in the bill. As I said to start, one of the things that disappointed us more was what was missing from the bill rather than what was in it. But out of the five things that we're deeply concerned about, that auctioning clause is one of them. Um, it runs coach and horses through the principle of it being a public resource. Practically, it will end up with it being in the hands of the highest bidders. There is no tightening of the economic link in the fisheries bill, which is one of the things we really want to see included. So without that, combined with auctioning, you could have massive multinational, hugely wealthy seafood companies go, well, British fishing is on the up, so we will come in and waive our chequebook and um, outbid everybody else. Even the biggest companies in Britain couldn't compete with some of those Far Eastern companies. So if we go down the auctioning route, we have got an opportunity to, to kind of draw a line, as I think the Honourable Member for Orkney and Shetland said, between what was current um, quota resources, how it's been divvied out, not the way we would have chosen, and this kind of clean slate of what comes back. And if we go down the auctioning route, where it's monopolised into the hands of a few big uh, money or a few big interests with the financial firepower, it rides coach and horses through the government's objective of rebuilding coastal communities and family-based fishing. It supports that. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, about uh, effort and your mm. suggestions for. A, a hybrid scheme between mm. FQAs and days at sea. Yep. There's concerns that in the bill, the bill gives the Secretary of State powers to allocate fishing opportunities simply on days at sea without any qualification yep. after that. But the white paper spoke about there being a series of trials to assess whether days at sea would deliver against the objectives. Yep. Do you think that the simple inclusion of days at sea without any qualification that comes afterwards could make that more problematic? Well, well one of the amendments we'd actually put in, which might seem uh, contrary to members, uh, that fishermen would want to tighten a, a, what you could perceive as a noose on themselves, was to amend it to hours at sea. Um, and that was to get towards what we really need to get towards, which is a kind of catch per unit effort system of fisheries management. I think over the years, and it's one of the clauses that's in the bill we would like to see amended right at the start in Clause 1, it says management uh, will ensure that activities are, which suggests that government kind of takes a hammer and beats down the industry to meet what its requirements are. We would like to see that reversed to um, that uh, policy uh, requires management which delivers. In other words, the onus is in the government to say, OK, here's the objectives we want to meet. How do we move towards that? So we wanted it changed into ours 
of soak time at sea because that's a far more accurate method of delivering catch per unit effort where you're getting the accurate data to deliver management that actually achieves objectives rather than just trying to take a hammer to the industry to comply. Okay. Uh, finally, Mr Anderson, um, we've heard today that the, the way that fishing is conducted in UK waters has changed over the many years with new technologies and greater efficiency of how fishers can uh, catch fish. There is a new development in terms of fishing, which is electronic pulse beam fishing, mm -hmm. which I know uh, I personally have a lot of problems with. Mm -hmm. Although that's a level of detail which might not be included in a framework bill such as this one here, we've seen representation that suggests that that should be banned, and I um, tended to agree with them. Mm. Have you got any strong views about where electronic pulse beam fishing well, sits within acceptable fishing practices? Absolutely. Um, we feel, feel that should be banned outright immediately. You could put a subclause in that says until it proves that it isn't responsible for the, the environmental degradation that's been reported from fishermen all around the Southern North Sea where the derogations happened. Uh, certainly, I don't think anybody could say that the Dutch, who are primarily responsible for this, haven't taken the Michael um, where it's gone from being... That's the polite words I could think of there. Where it has gone from being a, a derogation against the ban that the European Commission's got itself in electric fishing. And let's remember here... Um, it was a derogation against the EU's own scientific advice. So it was a derogation for a trial to ascertain if this was a method. It's gone on for 10 years and it's got 100 boats on it. So that is a commercial fishery masquerading as a trial, and even the Dutch now hold their hands up to that. So we would like to see that banned. We'd also like to see uh, sand eel fishing in the Central North Sea banned, because that, for years and years and years, has taken away a key component of um, the food chain, the base of the food chain, both for seabirds, fish, and obviously fishermen. Um, it's of no benefit to either method, pulse fishing or sand eel fishing, to any UK vessels. Um, and also sand eel fishing, um, you can have the double dunt that the sand eels are taken for pig feed. So the British baking industry could uh, see a competitor's food costs go up. So there's a massive environmental gain there to put in a ban on both. It doesn't afflict any British industry. And I'm actually very surprised for a government that extols its in environmental uh, credentials with plastic cups and going to war on wet wipes hasn't taken the easy win of um, a pulse ban fish, a ban in pulse fishing. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got considerable interesting questions to this session, and we have to finish at 4pm, so could I ask for short questions and, and shorter answers, please? <coughs> Peter Aldous. Thank you, Mr. I won't comment on pulse fishing, because I do agree with them, Mr. Ban. The, we talked to, I think the Minister has said that the Government are happy to have, look at an effort-based pilot. Mm. I'm conscious that there has been a pilot in the past, mm. and I wondered what was the outcome of that, what shortcomings there were, and how, what lessons we might learn for future pilots. Well, that was one of the ones uh, when we devised this system that we realised <clears throat> there'd be massive failing. Again, that was a days at sea scheme. It was blunt. There was no effect of monitoring. Generally, it was smaller boats in southeast England. And I think even the fishermen themselves would hold their hands up and say um, they really knocked the backside out of the pilot. Uh, there was misreporting going on. They just, they just went out and, and, and kind of went on to on it. The system we are um, advocating is an hours-based system. Uh, you'd obviously have VMS now. And what we are wanting to get towards is a kind of fully integrated monitoring slash management system. So vessels would have, and they're not expensive to put on, vessels use a similar type of uh, technology for gear and door sensors, for telemetry of the fishing gear, inexpensive sensors that go onto any type of net, any type of fishing gear, and they monitor soak time. So you know the exact amount of time a vessel's gear is in the water. Um, they'd have a stipulation through either IVMS um, or full-on VMS uh, to be monitored as where they are, and also to fill out electronic logbooks that are here now. So you would be getting an up-to-date, haul-by-haul update of how much fishing effort was going in. So you know that boat towed six hours in this area, he caught X amount of fish for this size of gear. Chap over to the side, he towed similar gear, half the amount of fish. So you, you start to know where abundances are for size. So the one main control to, to go for for a pilot, again, is make sure it's rigorously, rigorously enforced, make sure it's an hours-based scheme, and the other main thing in it is this catch composition thing. And that really is the main control um, to, 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 to regulate the industry from everybody just going out and going tonto, like what they did last time, targeting, say, Dover soles or cod or bass. You say, yes, guys, you can catch them, you can keep them, but be aware, if you do that, your ceiling of hours is going to come clattering down to, to meet you. Brown. Thanks, Mr. Hanson. Um, I th think you touched on it earlier on. You said you'd probably come to it. Do you have a view on the discard prevention charging schemes that's in the bill and yes. how transparent it is and how it would actually work? Well, that's one of the things in the bill 
that very much seems to ride coach and horses over the idea that the bill is just an enabling act. Um, obviously, there's a bit of resonance, um, and okay, you could say understandably so, to, to career on towards a different type of management on an effort-based system. Yet somehow we've got a scheme here that's dropped out of the air uh, with no prior piloting, no prior consultation uh, that's just arrived onto the table. We are vehemently against it because we personally feel, and everybody uh, who's read it, uh, both in our membership and other organisations, feel that only an idiot that couldn't understand the implications, practical implications, of such a scheme would propose it. And really what we feel that uh, scheme is there to do is administratively um, kind of abrogate the failings of the current system whereby what the government is proposing to do is take all the repatriated resources, uh, use it as headroom um, to avoid choke species, whereby as of 2019, vessels have to cease fishing on the exhaustion of their lowest quota. So what's going to happen is you're going to have vessels go to sea, since many honourable members are from say, the South West, as, as the Minister is, haddocks is a huge problem there, um, the North Sea, Hakes one. So what is the government saying is we'll honour the fish that would choke you, would tie you up, we'll give you fish to keep fishing, but so there's no economic incentive there to target that species, you must land it for free. So what that scheme effectively creates is a giant shuttle service where boats are going to have to run in and out, in and out, in and out of harbour, landing all this fish that they can't profit from to allow them to keep fishing. Uh, and the big problem with that scheme then becomes, first one is retention of crew. Lads are not going to work to retain, well just now it's a 40% discard rate, so if they've got to retain that 40% for free, you're going to lose your crew very quick. The next question, there's no provision in the bill, is what happens to this fish is landed? You can't turn around and allow processors or hauliers or markets or shore-based people to profit from it, because otherwise that disadvantages the fishermen. So really, uh, the logical question for that um, clause is, are we going into some sort of Soviet system where the fishing industry is going to work for free for the government? Um, it's an ill-thought-out thing, and I think that needs taken out the bill, and it needs to come back once it's been properly tested, once it's been properly um, run in, to actually see if it works, because we see such pitfalls in it, and it doesn't actually we'll address have the to, We'll have to move, move quickly. Sorry about that, okay, We have to finish at 4pm, and we may even have a division in the House earlier, so we have to be quick on questions, or all members won't get in. Um, further questions, Mr Brown? Yes, sir. Just in, in terms of perverse incentive, I mean, you said we're processing to make money out of this fish. You said we landed be free, yeah. but there, could there not be a risk of collusion in terms of fish landing and processors so that some of that money is recouped? Yeah. It would be difficult to some extent now, um, because it would come back to being blackfish, which was really yeah. stamped out with um, a vessel monitoring system and designated ports legislation whereby now vessels have to book in three hours in advance and declare their catch. So obviously if you came in um, and you misdeclared that you didn't have that fish, which would be the only way to do it effectively, um, because otherwise you'd be declaring it and the government would know it was there and, and taking it up the road. Obviously at the ceiling you could say, well, Maholman got his tally wrong. So there is, there is uh, some degree of open to abuse, but the thing that disappoints us most with it, where our system works with this one allowing um, fish to come in, uh, does not is it doesn't address the fundamental flaw that is arbitrary quotas do not work in mixed fisheries. So all that happens is just now we're setting an arbitrary target that we try to hit. All this scheme does is allow you to make it right up to that target. It doesn't actually tell you is that more abundance of fish. So the way we would put it is in the South West with Haddock say or the North Sea with Hague, you could lift the quota up, double it, the fleet would still catch it. Does that tell you there's a greater abundance of species or does it basically show you've gave more legislative headroom to bring fish ashore? The only way that scheme would work is if you increase the quota disproportionately high, which no one's going to agree with, and since there's no economic incentive there for the boats to go off and handle all this fish they're not profiting from, you would see where the fleet came up to and what was a kind of natural abundance catch, say maybe 60,000 tonnes, but if you'd set the quota at 100,000, you'd know there wasn't um, that, that okay, abundance there. So the scheme effectively doesn't Bill work. Bill taken out. Bill Sorry. Grant. I, I noted that you were very much against the big boys or the wealthy, the financially powerful coming in uh, on an auction system to buy up the quotas or the right mm. to fish. Mm. And bearing in mind in the journey we had created slipper skippers who had smaller quotas, quotas or rights to fish sold along to these. What's your alternative to that system? How would you make it fair? Briefly. Well, the way we want to see it is the auctioning clause taken out and a direct replacement putting in um, what we've called the kind of one tonne to one boat principle whereby 
Um, the resource is seen as a national resource, legislated as such. And what happens is all that repatriated resources that we gain under zonal attachment, which is missing from the bill, uh, anything about zonal attachment. But what ends up happening is that national pot of resources get all allocated to all vessels in a sea area fairly, equally. So in the west coast of Scotland, where we're both from, um, I think there's about 60,000 tonnes of mackerel uh, could be repatriated back, worth about 60 million. There's about 100 vessels left in the west coast of Scotland with the capability to go to that fishery. So what you would turn around and say, therefore, then, is each west coast fishing boat in that icy sea area for that stock gets 600 tonnes each. That applies across any stock. And then what we would like to see with that is, unlike it just being administrated on a um, spreadsheet like the non-sector is, which ends up where DEFRA just says, well, we'll get 12 tonnes for 12 months, spread it out equally over the months, is that that fish can be held in a PO, not monetarily traded, not rented, not bought, not sold, but you can hold it in a PO as a kind of holding vessel to use it at the best time of year when that fishery is maybe on, rather than kind of trying to spread 600 tonnes over 10 months. Um, and if you can't use that resources, it goes back into the national pot. We believe that has got a huge degree of simplicity to it, legislatively and operationally. It would provide the flexibility for um, vessels to use that fish at the best time of year. <coughs> and obviously, it would allow it to be reabsorbed back into the national pool. And that's what we would like to see Thank you, done. Thank you. Alistair Carmichael. We've got nine minutes left for four members wish to speak. Alistair yeah, Carmichael. Yeah, yeah. They've told us this morning that they wanted to see a commencement date on the face of the mm. bill, namely the 31st of December 2020. Mm. Um, what advantages do you think there would be to that amendment? We would agree with that. We have one, it's actually the first one uh, we've put together ourselves. Um, we are obviously aiming for 2019. Uh, with the way negotiations are going, it probably will end up being 2019, hopefully if God's merciful. And... Um, and uh, yeah, we, we would absolutely agree with that. Our big fear is if there isn't a commencement date, the Secretary of State has the powers, uh, depending on what government's there, to kick the can down the road. Um, so we'd very much agree with, with a commencement date there, preferably 2019, um, when we actually are a fully independent coastal state. Because obviously, as we've made clear, and we'd like to put it in the record, the transition is an existential threat to the industry. Because we leave, we then sign up to reobey the CFP. We will have to obey all EU law. They can enforce any detrimental legislation they can please, and they have every incentive to do so, because under un UNCLOS Article 62.2, um, if a state cannot catch its own resources, it must give the surplus to its neighbours. So the EU has got absolutely every incentive. They have even mentioned it in their own studies in PESH committees uh, that this could happen, to run a bulldozer over the top of the UK fleet. So we would implore members um, that fishing can't be in a transition. Uh, and obviously, the wider deal, the big problem is, is that the EU says that um, there must be a future relationship or we're into the backstop, and that future relationship um, says that it will be based for fisheries on current access and quota. So the EU, that isn't conjecture, the EU has quite clearly said that Gibraltar and fisheries are getting it. Uh, in the words of Mr Macron, um, as uh, my rusty French translated. So there's a huge danger of the fishing going into that, and as the Honourable Member for um, Orkney and Shetland said in the Chamber, um, given um, the current poor state of negotiations as they've been conducted, uh, every red line has been breached. Um, if the government truly had a commitment to fisheries not getting mangled uh, again and bartered a second time, it wouldn't have been in a transition in the first place. Um, okay, that's, that's, thank you. Uh, I want to get members in. David Dukid. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Hanson. Um, Mr Brown, there's been a lot of talk today about the ownership of quotas, mm -hmm. and I think <coughs> Mr Carmichael said earlier that if, if we were to design this again from scratch, we wouldn't start from where we are. No. And a, a lot of what you described sounds like, yeah, that might work if you were starting from scratch. Um, but I can't, I can't help but feel a bit squeamish about the idea of taking something away from somebody that owns something. Yeah. I mean, that's just a, I'm a conservative, yeah. I can't help myself. Um, but so, uh, the um, how fair? I mean, I mean, it just does. It's just, I don't see that as being fair. No. Not not only does it uh, involve taking ownership of an asset away from someone, essentially, or maybe over time. Yeah. But how fair would, do you do you think it is that the 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 fishermen who would benefit from that, i.e., the smaller fishermen mm -hmm. who would get a bit a bigger share of the yeah. quota, um, some of whom having. Uh, maybe in previous generations, uh, having benefited financially for, from selling that quota to the larger fishermen yeah. in the first place. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. Um, that's why fishing for leave has been um, vehemently 
are, are, are absolutely explicit right from the start that FQAs as they stand, the current quota and the current FQA shouldn't be touched. Um, because we do agree with you, it opens up a total legal can of worms, a moral can of worms to turn around and say, OK, this shouldn't have happened, but it has happened, but we're going to take it off you. Absolutely agree. Our solution to preserving the FQAs whilst moving to a more equitable system of management, both for fishermen and the fish, was to convert them into this flexible catch composition entitlement. And that's very simple to do. It's legislatively no problem, because all you're doing is saying that your FQA isn't an entitlement to a kilogram, it's an entitlement to a percentage. So the resources all come back, and the current resources go into a pool, a national pool. That's divided out as time. Everybody gets an equal stake of time to reach their potential. But those biggest quota holders, both in the southwest and the northeast, that have heavily invested in FQAs, get the benefit of their investment. Because when the fleet's national average might work out at 5% cod in the North Sea, those who've invested heavily in FQAs would get their 30% or 40% or whatever. Okay, so we think that's a fair Owen way Smith. to do it. Owen Smith. Thanks, Mr. Hanson. Um, Mr Brown, are you disappointed that two and a half years after Brexit so little seems to be resolved in concrete terms of what future no idea the level fishing. of my disappointment. Well, perhaps you could tell us in a minute. And are you worried that um, several Cabinet members have warned that transition could go on for as long as four years? Yes, absolutely. Again, that then comes back but makes it worse. It pours petrol in the bonfire I've described to you that in the transition the EU's got every incentive to run a bulldozer over the top of us. They can abolish a 12 mile limit, um, they could fully enforce the discard ban in choke species and obviously we wouldn't be able to implement policy to mitigate that such as suggested in the bill. Um, they would be able to barter UK resources in international swaps because we won't be party to international agreements but the EU will be making them on behalf. And the other thing that really um, is devastating both uh, right round the country is currently the UK relies on a lot of swaps uh, in the EU to get in fish that would otherwise probably be ours under zonal attachment. Um, we won't be able to do that because we won't actually be sitting at the table anymore. So we'll be trapped in this kind of halfway house where the EU's got every incentive to take a great big stick and beat us with it like a piñata. Um, it's not a position that I think is equitable for the survival of the industry. And to be brutally honest, by the time we get round to a new British policy, if we're not shoveled into the backstop, which is a high likelihood of, there won't be a fleet left to take advantage of it anyway. Paul Sweeney. Uh, thank you. Um, whether it's the smaller under 10 shellfish boats working out in the west coast ports like yeah. West Donaway or open over to the big commercial ports that are running Pelagic and yeah. whitefish fleets out of Fraser Bar and uh, Peterhead, what benefit to Scottish ports would there be of introducing an economic link of landing at least 50% of all fish in Scottish ports? Fully supportive of that. We've gone further, said 60%. Um, not just for landings, there's a huge benefit from that because currently just now uh, with the flagship problem that Britain has got after the Factor Tame case, we're obviously under freedom of establishment and freedom of movement. Um, any EU national could come in and buy up British entitlement. Um, and obviously with the British fleet originally struggling with so much loss of its own resources and regulatory ineptitude, many family fishermen felt compelled to sell. So that's a huge problem just now, as we see in the West Coast in Loch Inver. I think it was £30 million of fish went through Loch Inver and not a single um, Indigenous fishing boat. So that needs to be tightened up on. There's a huge benefit not just to the fishermen and their, their communities, but obviously processors and market share. Norway's crowning glory is not actually its fishing fleet. Norway's crowning glory is its dominance in processing and marketing globally. And that's something that Britain could equally compete in with the resource we've got. So we would like to see 60% landings, into the UK, sold and processed, because otherwise people will just put them in the back of a lorry and, and run them down the road. We want to see 60% beneficial ownership of any British vessel. That's no different than to the other Nordic countries to avoid foreign nationals or conglomerates buying out the UK fleet. And we'd also like to see 60% British crew, but with a five-year or thereabouts dispensation for foreign crew until we rebuild a, a future generation back into the industry to replace the one we've lost. The economic link absolutely needs to be there, and that's not an amendment we would implore that needs to, be, to go in. The Conservatives tried to do it in 1988 with the Merchant Shipping Act, and I argue if it was good enough for Mrs Thatcher, then it should be good enough for this government as well. I think uh, that brings us uh, almost to the end of the session.